tonight. Of course, we are in the midst of a big construction project, as you probably noticed as you pulled in. And hopefully we will have it completed by the end of this month and be, in the, uh, be able to use the entirety of the facility. But we have not been having Sunday evening services for the last couple of months during the construction project for some of the uh, logistic reasons. So I wasn't sure what kind of a turnout we had tonight, but I'm so pleased that uh, so many of you showed. I'm so pleased that we have so many visitors tonight. You are in for a treat. If you have not ever heard Avi uh, speak tonight, he is a wealth of information on a number of different topics. And of course, tonight he's going to talk to us about some of the uh, old events ongoing currently after the uh, Trump election, what's going on here in the United States and also in the Middle East. But uh, we are so glad that he is with us tonight. We are so glad that he brought his lovely wife of many years, Rachel, to be with us tonight. And if you haven't, please give Rachel a intro to Avi in just a little bit when he gets up to speak, but we're going to take up a love offering after this next uh, hymn, and I would like to invite you, if you are able and if you are willing, everything that goes into play tonight will be to support Avi and Rachel and their ministry as they sound the alarm traveling across the country. So if you have a check, you can just drop it in the plate. If you make it up to Fairview Baptist Church and just put Avi Lipkin down in the note, you will be able to deduct it as a contribution on your taxes. If you'd like to make a cash contribution, you are welcome just to drop in the plate. If you'd like us to keep a record of your cash contribution, then you will need to take one of the envelopes in the chair in front of you and fill it out, and we will keep proper records and have it for you at the end of the year. But again, we are so glad to have you with us, and we are looking forward to what will be shared with us this evening. Let's uh, ask the Lord to bless our night. Father, we thank you so much for the services this morning. We thank you for the, uh, the work that's being done. Lord, we thank you for our long friendship with Avi. And Lord, we thank you for all that he has been able to share with us over the course of the years. And we thank you for his return tonight. Lord, we also are grateful for Glenn and, and Glenn serving as an intermediary anymore and, and being able to facilitate and help get Avi when he's in town and get him scheduled in our church and different churches. And Lord, we thank you for those that you have brought together here this evening. God, I pray that you would focus uh, Avi, give him exactly what you want him to share with us tonight. Lord, teach us, help us to be uh, spiritually sensitive, but also politically savvy. And Lord, I pray that uh, our hearts would be open to learn truth. I pray that we present it clearly, and that Lord, we retain what we learn this evening. Lord God, it's our intent to be a lighthouse on this corner, shining into this community, joining hands with other churches across this state, and across this country, or building a firewall that uh, those that are standing in the gap. So God, I pray that you would uh, just accomplish your will through us. And Lord, I pray that you would bless those here tonight and bless and protect continually Avi and Rachel in their ministry across America. Lord, this all we do ask humbly in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. We look forward and, and love having Avi with us. He's always such a blessing for us. I'll tell you, before church started, five minutes or so before, you guys may have heard the shofar in the pastor's office. Did anybody hear it? I mean, I, I've been practicing for quite some time, and that was probably the best note I've ever hit on the shofar. I was going to have Paul, I thought I'd have Paul excited because I thought we'd start everything with a shofar deal. Paul comes in and looks at me and he says, please don't do that. <laughs> Well, anyway, I gave it my best intention. <laughs> Open my eyes that I may see. We'll sing this for our offertory hymn, and uh, we'll take up the offering on the third. Thank you. 
I put the uh, wireless, my headset that I normally wear, put it on uh, Avi tonight to make sure we have a little better recording. So if we can get that uh, hot, we will be good to go. Well, again, I had the privilege of meeting Avi probably uh, maybe, maybe 12 years ago, 10, 12 years ago. And what launched it was, uh, oh, I guess around 2004, 2005, when there was this press by our Republican administration to force Israel to give away Gaza allegedly for peace and although I wasn't well studied on the topic from a political perspective I was aware of the biblical history and I thought this is a foolish idea it's not going to work of course I will not go into the historical narrative on that but as I began to do some research and try to learn about Islam itself one of our members at that point in time brought to me a cassette tape, so that kind of dates this when you actually were using a cassette tape, but brought me a cassette tape from a Bible teacher out of uh, Calvary Chapel and Chuck Missler. And I'd never heard of, of Chuck Missler before, and uh, we were interviewing this, this guy named Victor Mordecai or Avi Lipkin. He had a pen name, a pseudonym. You know, let's trust them. never trust those people that have to use a, a separate name. But, but anyway, uh, I thoroughly enjoyed the tape and began, there was so much there, and quite frankly began a, became a, a pretty good fan of, of Missler and his ministry and, and certainly became a fan of, of Avi Lipkin. Uh, we had Avi come to our short church shortly thereafter, in fact we were already in this facility so it had to be around 2005, 2006, and Avi did a nine hour uh, training and that began me in my in-depth uh, study on the subject of Islam and we have had the pleasure of having Avi back with us probably at least a dozen times. Uh, Avi was born and raised in the uh, New York City area, in the state of New York, and grew up in the New York City area. Uh, studied a variety of, of uh, educational topics, including Sovietology. I made Aliyah to Israel in 1969, of course, married a treasure, and Rachel still works in listening to the uh, uh, media, uh, both written and uh, uh, verbal, uh, of, of, uh, of uh, Muslim Arab, Arab cultures over there trying to discern what they're talking about, what they're up to. And Avi is a, is a wealth of information about a variety of topics. I know his intended topic tonight, but those of you that know Avi know that that doesn't really mean anything. We may start here and we may wind up in Topeka, but I know that we are in for a blessing these next 45 to 50 minutes. So please give him your undivided attention and very please give a very warm welcome to our friend Avi Rachel. Is the only one 
which will give Christians representation in our government. Muslims are represented because they have a constituency. Uh, the Druze people have representation. The communists, the ultra-Orthodox, the nationalists. Uh, we have parties uh, that want to make pot legal. We have a taxi driver's political party. There are lots of taxi drivers. We have a divorced men's party. I'm telling you, we have 35 parties. It's crazy. So very, very few people really are interested in supporting a Judeo-Christian Bible block party. For the 100 signatures, 1,000 people refused to sign. There's a lot of enmity against Christians in Israel because of 2,000 years of European persecution of the Jews. Not American, European. But most Jews in Israel know nothing about America because half the Jews came from Islamic countries and half the Jews came from Soviet countries. So I have a very daunting challenge. And so last June, I submitted uh, my list of founders to the Israeli government, Department of Justice. And the answer was, we see it's taken you 11 years to get 100 signatures. Now, it's not written in any of the law books, but we have decided arbitrarily that any signature over six months old is invalidated. That cost me $18,000, which I paid my lawyer. My lawyer has another $18,000, which was intended for the bond, the Knesset bond. You have to post bond with the former party. And so now, and I've raised that too. No, <laughs> for these years I've been raising money and collecting signatures, raising money and collecting <coughs> signatures. And so now I've raised another $18,000 to the lawyer to submit this again July 1st. We have the signatures though, so it was a dry run. The people who signed will sign up again. And uh, I'm patient and I'm confident that we will raise not only $18,000, but we will raise the millions of dollars that we need for a campaign. Because every political party has to have offices and secretaries and vehicles. Israel also is a country where when you campaign, you have to campaign in four languages. Russian, Arabic, Hebrew, and English. Can you believe it? It's the only country in the world where you have to campaign in all the four languages. All my books, CDs, and DVDs that refer to the politics of Israel have to be translated into those four languages. So anyway, I'm not asking you for all that money. I'm just saying pray. Pray that God's will be done and that we shall achieve this. But the party will be resubmitted God willing, July 1st, please pray for us that this will succeed. Amen. And I'm very confident in the world. Uh, another point is, uh, with Chuck Misler, I have uh, a number of CDs and DVDs on the table. One of them is about the party made in 2006, uh, but I never made a DVD. So about two months ago, I went to a TV studio in Tel Aviv, in Israel, and I produced an English language DVD, which is now being reproduced here in Dallas. So I, sh I may have some if and when uh, it's ready next week when I come back. It'll be a DVD in English about the party, so I know many of you will be interested in seeing it. It will be updated. But July 1st is now our zero hour for submission and registration of the Judeo-Christian Bible Block Party. And at the end of the evening, I, I think you will remember my past messages that the Islamic terrorists who are already on American soil are planning to, well they're planning, they are already cataloging Jews and certain Christians for destruction, for death. It will be combined with 9-11 attacks on American soil. And I believe that will lead to a tsunami or a tidal wave of the Jews moving to Israel from America, Canada, Latin America, and Europe who have not been killed by Al-Qaeda and ISIS and others that are here already. And I'm not uh, complaining about President Trump, I think he's doing a great job, but the terrorists are here already. It's not his fault. And more terrorists are on their way. And you cannot stop it. And it's God's will that Jews are going to go home to Israel. And it's God's will that the Christians who are married to the Jews, or related to the Jews, will move with them. Because God wants Jews and Christians in Jerusalem to receive the Messiah. And I think the Messiah is close. Closer than anyone could imagine. And he will come like a thief in the night. 
We'll, we'll get to that. I'm just giving an introduction to what I'm going to say tonight. I haven't started my message yet. My second announcement is that I'm very proud of my older son, Aaron. My older son, Aaron, I'm also proud of my younger son, Yaakov. But Aaron works very closely with me on many things regarding the party and regarding the land of Israel. My son has a, 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 a tourism uh, for Christians company. We, we specialize in Christian and Messianic tourism to Israel. And one of the things my son noticed is he, he's very active going to lectures. He goes to lectures that he listens to about archaeology. And I don't know if you know this or not, but every year the archaeologists have another dig in every place. And every year they find new things, seals and clay tablets and things that prove the authenticity of the Bible, yeah, yeah. the veracity of the Bible. And he has on the table three DVDs that he has produced. One is about Shiloh, one is about Bethel, and one is about Gilgal. These are all names you read about in the Bible. And I'm not going to spend too much time because you didn't come here tonight to hear about archaeology in Israel, though it's very important that you hear about it. But just to give you an idea. I was born in the United States in 1949. 1962, I was 13 years old, an avid stamp collector. And I still am. And I have a photographic memory. And I'll never forget that the United States Post Office issued a series of stamps in 1962 commemorating the centenary of the Civil War. And one of the battles of the Civil War is called the Battle of Shiloh. And so for me, Shiloh was always in the Seat, in Tennessee. That's how Northern pronounces it. The Seat. And I was going to Hebrew school at the time, and my Hebrew teachers told me, well, guess what? Shiloh's in the Bible. I said, oh, yeah, where? Oh, we don't know. It's under the earth. It, it, you know, it, it's buried. We haven't found it yet. That was in 62. In 67, five years later, we had the Six-Day War. And Israel liberated Judea and Samaria, praise God. Amen. So the Israelis would go to the different Arab Christian villages to ask them, do you know where Shiloh is? So for example, there's, there's a village in Arabic called Kafr Sila. Kafr Sila in Arabic means the village of Shiloh. It's up on a mountain. And the Christians there said, yeah, we know where it is. It's right down there in the valley. Because the Christians always maintain the tradition of where the holy sites are. So the archaeologists came in, started digging, and they found four churches, four Greek Orthodox churches. And at the entrance to one of them, they dug down six feet. And at the entrance of the church, there was a mosaic. And the mosaic said, may the Lord Jesus bless the people of Shiloh. Bingo. <laughs> now we know where Shiloh is. Now what's interesting about Shiloh also is that they found a tell. A tell in Israel is a multi-civilizational mound in which people would build their houses based on broken pieces of the civilization before them. If you ever read James Michener, how many people have read The Source? If you read The Source, it's a very good book. It's a fictional book, but it explains exactly about the archaeology in Israel based on the tell at Megiddo, Armageddon. So we know where Shiloh is now. Now why is this important? You know, we face, we Jews and Christians, we Israelis and Americans, face two enemies. One of them is Islam. Islam will be defeated very soon. The reason it will be defeated very soon is because Islam is completely crazy. It's evil, it's crazy, and it's not going to be the Jews or the Christians that terminate Islam, it's going to be the one world government. Because when they come to blow up the oil wells in Saudi Arabia and kill the king of Saudi Arabia, who they call a Jew, and when they blow up the black stone in Mecca, which is the holiest place of Islam, saying that it's a pagan place, which it is, they're cutting off the head of the snake. They're, they're killing their own religion. But the important thing is the mammon, the oil. When they destroy the oil or they try to, it will wreak havoc on the world economy. And the one world government cannot tolerate that. 
So Islam, I think, will be banned very soon. The great threat, and I'm going off now into a new direction. <laughs> you know what? I haven't started my message yet. <laughs> Why am I going to, into the new direction? Because I will soon be out of work. Islam will be banned. Happy ending, right? The problem is, it, the world system will be the one world government system. And every knee will be forced to bend and every tongue to swear loyalty to this one world government, based on mammon. It's an evil system. And I'm going to give you the very end of my message right now, but then I'm going to do some Hollywood flashbacks. <laughs> when ISIS blows up the oil wells, and the one world government intervenes and says, enough is enough. I mean, you could decapitate millions of Christians in the Middle East, that's okay. I mean, that's what the one world government might say, because nobody likes the Christians. You know why nobody likes the Christians? Because nobody likes the Jews either. Because we have chosen God and we have chosen to be anointed with God. And like I said before, what's going to make the one world government very angry is the blowing up of the oil wells. So here comes something you might want to think about. I believe they're going to come to Israel and say to Israel, listen, we have a problem with Saudi Arabia. ISIS is going to blow up the oil wells. So what we're going to do is, we are going to secure the oil wells in the eastern part of the kingdom of Saudi Arabia, and you Israelis are going to occupy the western part of the kingdom, which is Mecca, Medina, well, the black zone is gone, Mecca's finished, and Mount Sinai, which is in northwest Saudi. How many people know Mount Sinai is in northwest Saudi? And I want you to know I'm working very closely with Jim and Penny Caldwell, and I hope, how many people know Jim and Penny Caldwell? I have only, I think, two DVDs left with theirs on the table, and then we're heading back to Dallas to restock. I'm praying that we will have an, a, a, a world conference on Bible study, proving the veracity of the Bible in Arabia and in Israel. And that my son and I and Jim and Penny and maybe one or two other world-renowned uh, speakers will speak on the Bible, proving the veracity of the Bible. Anyway, so the one world government people say to Israel, you know what, since there's no more Islam, and Kaaba's gone, and Mecca's gone, you Jews can now go and build your temple in Jerusalem. Not only can you Jews build your temple, we are ordering you to build your temple. The one world government is ordering Israel to build a temple in Jerusalem. And we're going to help you. We're going to pay for the temple. We're going to do everything you need to build that third temple in Jerusalem. And then we're going to send the leader of the one world government to officiate at your temple. Duh! <laughs> That's the message. Do you realize how close we are to Messiah? When is it all going to happen? Do you remember the song? Manana, manana, manana is good enough for me. I don't know. Does anyone know the time of the coming of the Lord? Like a thief in the night. So anyway, we have to contend, start to prepare to contend seriously not only with Islam, but with the one world government that hates God, hates Christianity, hates Judaism, and wants to impose a one world government dictatorship. And it's out there, it really does exist. I, I've had experience with it. Now I start my message. You know, I'm married to a very special woman. If it weren't for Rachel, I wouldn't be here tonight. If it weren't for Rachel, I would not have written my books or produced CDs and DVDs with Missler. If it weren't for Rachel, I would not be alive today. Because I've been sick a number of times and Rachel stood there and watched me like a hawk. She had to. You know, Rachel's a very serious woman and she always has a knife in her hand. She says, if you don't take care of your health, I'm going to kill you. <laughs> and Rachel has been my guide and my teacher because her work in the She's, her work in the Israeli government has been to monitor the broadcasts of the Arabs. And you know, Rachel just retired a year ago. I didn't know if you knew that, Pastor Paul, that Rachel just retired. And you know, I have to tell you something. The, the Messiah is coming is very soon, you know why? I, people used to ask me, when is Jesus returning? You're from Israel. I said, yes, Jesus will return when my wife retires. <laughs> so it's very imminent. So anyway, 30 years ago, Rachel picked up broadcasts in which the, the Saudis were saying 
We all know that America is the great Christian saint. And there's one of two possibilities. Either we destroy the great Christian saint in America with 9-11 attacks. And some people indeed went ahead and did it. Or we convert America to being a Muslim country. And it's going to take us 150 years. Now, the Arabs have been around 1,400 years. And that's two hours of guard duty. Yeah. <laughs> Once I took an army officer's course in Israel, and the commander who was a captain, a commander of the class, was saying, any phone goes off, it's two hours of guard duty tonight. And the phones were going off, but it was phones of generals. <laughs> so we have a general in the front row here. Okay. So, give me a second, I have to reorganize. I always lose my train of thought. The phone goes off. So, just give me a second. Yeah. Okay, so, where was I just a moment ago? Oh, so Rachel retired, the sign's coming soon. So Rachel picked up a broadcast 30 years ago in which the Saudis were saying, we have plenty of time. We will invade America methodically. It'll take 150 years, but we will make America a Muslim country, and we will ban Christianity. And of course the Jews all die, and some of the Christians. My wife heard this 30 years ago. And my wife's bosses in Jerusalem are all socialists. We didn't believe a word she was saying. You see, because socialists don't believe in God, they're what we call atheists. And we have them in Israel. We have them in our government. We have them in our media. And you should just know there is no difference between the Israeli media and the American media. There are no right-wing Jews in the Israeli media. None. And there are none in the American media either, right-wing Christians. It's unbelievable how parallel the Israeli and the American systems are. And so Rachel gets his belly full, comes home at night, and hubby has to calm her down. She can't sleep because nobody's listening to her. 9-11, my wife heard this, not prediction, this promise by the Muslims they were going to destroy the World Trade Center. This is six, seven years before. And I wrote about it in my book four years before 9-11. Because Rachel watched the Arabic TV, and behind the newscasters on the wall was a big, long picture of the two trade towers in, on fire. This was years before they destroyed the World Trade Center. This was a plan. Because the way to destroy the United States, the way to destroy the great Christian saint is to destroy the economy. The way to destroy the economy is to blow up the planes and bring down the tall buildings that we are so proud of. And nobody believed her. All the Arabs are just talking. All the Arabs have a wild imagination. 1,001 Arabian Nights, they're not serious. No, no, they are serious. And sometimes, very often, crazy people are very serious. 30 years went by, Rachel retires, and one of the last broadcasts she picks up, the Arabs are saying, the same Arab station, we said 30 years ago it was going to take us 150 years to make America Muslim. We were wrong. It's only going to take 30 years. In other words, America is well on the way to becoming a Muslim country. And President, former President Obama said, America is the greatest Muslim country on earth. How many people heard that? I'm not making this stuff up. Just before the elections of 2008, the Saudis come out with a broadcast where they're saying, we will have a Muslim president in the White House in 2008. This is all by plan. Rachel picked it up in the media. Nobody believed her. 2010, Rachel picks up a broadcast, and there's a Southern Baptist pastor in Milton, Florida, by the name of Carl Gallops. Do you know Carl Gallops? It, it's unbelievable. You know, I'm like a bumblebee cross-pollinating the United States. <laughs> Because many people don't know what's going on in the next county. And I've been in 47 of the 48 continental states. I have not yet suffered for Christ on ch church at the beach in Hawaii. <laughs> or in Simon, Alaska. But I've been in the 47 of the 48 continental states. 
And Pastor Carl Gallops picked up a broadcast that I did with Gary Stearman. How many people know Gary Stearman? Prophecy Watchers. And it was based on, on information my wife picked up. She was watching an interview on Egyptian TV. This is January 19th, 2010. And the, it was like, it was called the Round Table Discussion. And the foreign minister at that time, Abu Ghait, was debating with Muslim Brotherhood people on TV. And he said to them, calm down guys, you keep attacking Mubarak, but we want to tell you something. You want to destroy Israel? Terrific. But you have to calm down. And I want to help you to calm down and tell you, I had a one-on-one -on -one meeting with President Obama, and he swore to me that he's a Muslim. That his father from Kenya was a Sunni Muslim. How many people know his father was a Muslim from Kenya? I'm not talking about was he born in Kenya, which I believe he was. I wasn't talking about the false uh, social security number he has. Where's Eric Holder and Loretta Lynch? This thing should have been prosecuted. I think it will be. And then he said, my stepfather in Indonesia was a Sunni Muslim. How many people remember that? Soatoro. He's also known as Barry Soatoro. You know, on his foreign student card at Columbia University, this is Barry Soatoro. I mean, you guys had a president, you didn't even know his name. Is it Mubarak, Hussein Obama, or Barry Soatoro? And his social security number is a false number. Just for that, you go to jail. And Eric Holder and Loretta Lynch weren't around. And he said, I was raised in a mosque and in a madrasa in Indonesia until age 11. How many people remember Francis Xavier? The Catholic, but not Catholics, but everyone knows. He was the one who said, give me a child until 10 and I'll make him a man. Obama was made a Muslim man in Indonesia in the mosque and in the madrasa. And he said, the greatest sound he ever heard was the call to prayer of Islam. Where they say Allah Akbar. Allah Akbar means Allah is greater than the God of the Jews and the Christians. Allah is greater? Who said he was greater than God? Satan. Do you know what the Muslims call their God? The greatest of all the liars and deceivers. Who's the greatest of all the liars and deceivers? Does our God love the Jews and Christians and all human beings? Their God hates the Jews and hates the Christians and all human beings. Who is that? Satan. How many people know that Pastor Paul is allowing a convicted criminal to speak for the pulpit? I've got a three-year jail sentence in Switzerland for saying these things. That Allah is Satan and Islam is not a religion but a criminal psychosis bent on killing every human being on the face of the earth. So the Christian EDU political party paid the fine and it got commuted to a 10-year probation. But I'm not going skiing in Switzerland anytime soon. <laughs> my, my Christian friends in Switzerland said, Oh, Avi, grow up, get over it. Come here, go to jail, and we will take Rachel shopping. <laughs> and you have visitation rights, color TV, kosher food, and you can write your next book. <laughs> See how Christians have this positive way of looking at things. I said to Rachel, you know what, I, they've convinced me, I'm going to jail in Switzerland. She said to me, oh yeah? Do you know who controls the jails in Switzerland? The Muslims. And if you go to jail in Switzerland, it, the Muslims will kill you. And if you want the Muslims to kill you, tell me, I'm first online, she said. <laughs> I, we have a very, very funny banter. <laughs> and the reason I'm the best you know, expert on Islamic terrorism is because I'm married to it. <laughs> And so President Obama, former President Obama, according to Abu Ghraib, says, I've got Obamacare problems to deal with, I've got American economic problems to deal with, but I swear I will overcome these problems and then I will show the Muslim world what I'm going to do to destroy Israel. And you know what? My wife's bosses didn't believe her. I said it on Gary Stearman, you know, prophecy in the news or uh, prophecy watchers, you know, I would say these things. And uh, so Pastor Carl Gallup made a YouTube about it, 5 million hits. 
But of course, the American media wouldn't pick up on it. Not politically correct. And I want you to know I'm very depressed. Eight years of Obama, I'm very depressed because I'm going around sharing a message that nobody believes, except maybe some of you guys. And then he wins the election again in 2012. And I say to myself, where are the Christians? This, this country is sliding down a, a steep precipice. When is it going to end? Praise God, November the end. I saw the Democrats crying, and I started crying too, but for the opposite reason. <laughs> and you know, Rachel said to me, I am not letting you go to the United States again if Hillary is with It's too dangerous. If Trump wins, we get the tickets the next day, which is what we did. That's when we got our tickets to come. Praise God. And I wanted just to look a little bit at how Obama won and how Trump won. And forgive me, I'm not a racist. I love the blacks. I speak in black churches. I love the Hispanics. I speak in Spanish in Hispanic churches. I love everybody. I love the Muslims too. I don't think I'm going to speak in the mosque anytime soon. <laughs> and uh, the engineers, you know, when you run for office, you have assistants who engineer the election campaign plan and they prepare the path for you to win the elections. So the guys who prepared Obama's election and succeeded said, well, you know what, in 2008, all the blacks will vote for you because you're a black. They did, 13%. All the Hispanics will vote for you because they're a minority, 13%. And they did, that's 26%. Jews, not too much, 2%. They did. Muslims, and you know, I've said this in this church many times, and many people are very angry with me for exaggerating, but I say you've got anywhere between 20 and 30 million Muslims in America, and nobody talks about it. Because you've got 9 million Shiites, 7 million Sunnis, and 4 million black Muslims. 20 million. And that's omitting the Somalis, and the Turks, and the Chechens, the Albanians, and the Bosnians, and Indonesians, and, and African Muslims, and crazy Americans who convert to Islam. So, all Obama needed in that first election was 15% of the white vote. And that's how he won. And the same with 2012, the same engineering went on. 2016, Trump versus Hillary. The first mistake the Democrats made was that Hillary was white. Number two, she identifies with the establishment that all the minorities hate. Okay, but here come some interesting points. Many Republicans were against uh, Trump. He still won. And I want to tell you something, blacks are great people, and their churches are conservative. And a lot of the abortion in this country is aimed at decreasing the black population in this country. How, people, how many people know that? So the blacks have gone through a Democratic Party Planned Parenthood genocide. Nobody talks about it. Hispanics, they're great people. I speak in their churches in Spanish. And they're conservatives and they're family people. And a lot of the Hispanics voted for Trump too. Jews are only 2%, so it's, uh, it doesn't make much of a difference. And I think, I think if Trump continues with his present path, many Jews are going to come over. This is going to be a, a, a remarkable revolution. Even some Muslims voted for him. But with the, many, many Republicans opposing him, I think it was a massive miracle of God that Trump won the elections on November 8th. Praise God. And I ask you all to pray for Trump's long life and good health, and that he will be allowed to complete his mission. Yes. He's got to purge the military, purge the government of the Muslims and the crazy people who were brought in by Obama, and put in kosher, <laughs> kosher Christians and Jews to run this country. He met with Netanyahu, and I want you to know, I, I take certain liberties, because I don't, I'm not paid by the Israeli government, I'm an independent. I see Netanyahu and Trump as alter egos. I see them really as brothers. And, you know, there's this discussion about moving the embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem, which I think is a great idea. Amen. But I think that Netanyahu said to Trump, you need to focus on I don't want to say I'm purging your government. You need to focus on what you need to focus and not be distracted 
by moving the embassy a move which would cause tremendous damage at this time with the Muslims. You know, there's this myth that the Jews control everything. Well, that, that, that's not true. Then there's this myth that the Arabs control everything, which is partially true, but not so good. And I want to tell you something else also. And this will lead me towards the, the end of my message. I moved to Israel in 1968. Studied at the university until 71. 73, I was in the Yom Kippur War. And I was in artillery, just a crew man, private. And we were told in 73, 74, up to 77, war with Egypt is inevitable. My wife was picking up broadcast. War between Egypt and Israel, inevitable. So we were in a gun hall ready for battle. And all of a sudden, without anyone realizing it was a good secret, Menachem Begin and Anwar said, I make peace. We had to give up Sinai. And I supported the agreement, but with mixed feelings. Because you know, we shouldn't be giving up land that God gave to us. That's right. Amen. Wait a second. Wait till I finish the message. <laughs> because God causes us to flip-flop many times. So Israel gave up half the Golan, gave up uh, Sinai, gave up Gaza. And you know, you all know what we got for giving up Gaza. We got rockets. But an important point. To this day, we do not have really good relations with Egypt. You don't see Egyptian Christian pilgrims coming to Jerusalem. They're not allowed to. Egyptian Muslims don't really want to come to Israel. And if you're an Israeli Jew, you really cannot walk through the streets of Cairo with a keep on your head and be identified as a Jew because there will be Muslim Brotherhood people there who will kill you. So it's not really peace what we have with Egypt. However, the threat of ISIS is so great in Sinai and in Egypt that the Egyptian military is closer to the Israeli military today as an ally than ever before. And so there's a very strong alliance militarily between Israel and Egypt. And because of this alliance, at least at this time, Egypt will not attack Israel. If Egypt doesn't attack Israel, then the rest of the Arab world really cannot do that either. Same with Jordan. Jordan is a really close next door neighbor. We have actually pretty good commerce with Jordan. I do see Jordanian uh, license plates on cars in Jerusalem. Jordanians drive over to Israel. And I chat with them sometimes at a red light. And, uh, Hello, how are you? Welcome. They're very friendly. The Jordanians, or the Jordanian leadership, the king of Jordan, does not like Israel. King Abdullah is descended from the so-called prophet Muhammad. So he has to hate the Jews, and he does. And everything he does in the UN is against Israel. But King Abdullah of Jordan is totally dependent on Israel to protect him from ISIS and from others. There was a time that Saddam Hussein threatened Jordan. There was a time Saudi Arabia threatened Jordan. There was a time Syria threatened Jordan. And Jordan could only main, maintain stability because Israel was there. In fact, I'm going to tell you something I've never said here before. I don't know if you know this or not, but in Amman, Jordan, capital of Jordan, which we can see from our house, uh, they had water in the taps in their houses two days out of the week. Five days, no water. Jordan doesn't have water. It has to be rationed out. Today in Jordan, there is water running in the taps 24-7. You know why? Because as part of the peace agreement with Israel, Israel provides them with water. Now, Israel is not a country that has a lot of water. So how do we do it? You know, the Muslims spend billions and trillions of dollars on missiles and weapons of mass destruction. We spend our money on desalination plants. And so today, 70% of the water that Israelis drink is from the ocean. And so we make enough to give to the Jordanians. That's why the Jordanians have water. I will bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you. And so the Syrians have their civil war. 1.6 million Syrians moved to Jordan. And Israel provides water for the 1.6 million Syrians living in Jordan. So I think the Jordanians really kind of need us, because one of the first things you need is water. 
So we have peace with Egypt, we have peace with Jordan. Lebanon is a mess, we still don't know where that's all going. But we were told, I was told as an Israeli officer in the Army Spokesman's Office in 93, 94, that Syria alone could still take out Israel. That Syria alone had missiles with VX and serene and biological and atomic weapons that could take out most of Israel. So I want to ask you a question. Is there a God? Didn't God say to the Jews who had just left Egypt and were facing the Amalekites and other evil enemies, God says, you be silent, I will fight your battle. Didn't he say that in the book of uh, Exodus? You be quiet, you be silent, I'm fighting the battle for you. So let me ask you another question. Where is Syria today? Syria doesn't exist anymore. Syria is divided up into cantons. You have Sunnis, you have Shiites, you have Druze, you have Christians, you have Yazidis, you have Kurds. Syria is totally fragmented. It is destroyed as a country. Isaiah 17 verse 1, Damascus will be destroyed in a day. Now what's a day in God's counting? A day could be a decade. <coughs> Syria is every day being demolished a little more, a little more, a little more. Is it the Jews' fault? I'm asking you, not the Jews' fault. I will curse those who curse you and bless those who bless you. The Syrians have been fighting Israel and fighting Israel and cursing Israel. God destroyed Syria. Amen? Where's Iraq? Remember Saddam Hussein? Lost 39 missiles at Israel. Where's Iraq today? Iraq is also divided into three cantons. Kurdish, Sunni, and Shiite. And I have news for you. It's going to happen to Turkey. It's in my most recent book, Islamic Rivalry. Turkey today is 31% Shiite. Erdogan, the leader of Turkey, hates the Shiites. He hates Bashar al-Assad. He hates the Christians. He hates anyone who's not a Sunni Muslim. But the Iranians, who are Shiite, said to everyone, you mess with Bashar al-Assad, we're going to mess with you. We're going to overturn Turkey. 31% of Turkey is Shiite, 25% is Kurdish. The Kurds have their own war with the Turks. Turkey is 44% Sunni Turk, which means they're a minority in their own country. And I predict Turkey is going to come crashing down. Because those who bless Israel are blessed and those who curse Israel are cursed. How many people heard the news today that the Turks you know, the Turks are arresting all their journalists, all their teachers, all their judges, all these people who are not fanatic Muslims are being arrested, thrown in jail, and killed. And so the German government, you heard of Angela Merkel, right? And Angela Merkel is complaining that a lot of these Turkish journalists being thrown in the slammer are also German citizens. The Turks don't care. And so the Germans are not allowing Turkish minister, government ministers to speak in Germany. And so what did Erdogan say yesterday? That the behavior of the Germans is typical Nazi behavior. Luke was talking about Nazi behavior. Because Islam is a Nazi system. Don't call it a religion. It is a Nazi system. The only difference between Islam and Nazism is that Islam wants to kill the Jews on Saturday and the Christians on Sunday. And you look at Iran. I'm going to share something now very scary with you. But it, in the end, it's good news. Everything is good news. Because God has a plan. The Iranians are closer to an atom bomb than ever before. And this deal that Obama signed with the Iranians, many people say to me, but I'm happy to say he's a Sunni. He's giving the Iranians all this money and all this help. And Do you know that Obama gave the Iranians hydrogen bomb fusion technology. So the Iranians now are building a hydrogen bomb. It scares the heck out of the Saudis. But the purpose is to destroy Israel. My wife Rachel picked up a broadcast from the Saudis that Obama has three tasks. Destroy the Shiites, destroy the Jews, destroy the Christians in America. 
So what Obama is doing is he's giving the Iranians enough rope to hang themselves. Iran was on the verge of bankruptcy. Give them 150 billion dollars, you postpone the bankruptcy. That's what Obama did. Give them the technologies to wage war with Israel. So if the Saudis say to Obama, destroy Shiite Iran and destroy Jewish Israel, what better way is there to do that than to cause the Iranians and the Israelis to go to war against each other? That's why he gave them the $150 billion in the hydrogen bomb technology. There is no peaceful application for fusion. You have a peaceful application for fission, for uranium, not for hydrogen bomb technology. So to make a long story short, President Obama was kind of hoping that the Israelis would launch a preemptive attack, causing the Iranians to launch their missiles at Israel, causing Hezbollah to launch missiles at Israel. And Israel very wisely remained silent because God said, you be silent and I will fight your war for you. So, my prayer for the Iranian people and I love the Iranian people. They were allies of ours under the Emperor Cyrus. How many people remember the Emperor Cyrus? He's described in the Bible as the Savior. Because Cyrus sent the Jews home to rebuild the temple. He sent his army to escort them. He gave them gold and silver. So the temple was rebuilt in Jerusalem because of the Persians. And the Persians were allies in 614 AD, fighting against the Byzantines. And the Shah of Iran was our ally. Next week we have a Jewish holiday called Purim. How many people have heard of Purim? The Iranian people are not our enemy. They never were. The problem is the Islamic fanatic system of the Ayatollahs. Shiite system. Which the Shiites are, which the Sunnis want to destroy. How much more time do I have, Pastor? 15 minutes. Okay, now I'm going to go into something which continues it. So I think that the Iranian regime eventually will be overthrown by the people. I think Iran eventually will go bankrupt. God will deal with Turkey. God will deal with Iran. There is no need for an Israeli war against these people. Israel? I don't realize this. Israel's economy is stronger now than ever before. Our high tech, our whole economy is blooming. Today, this morning, I heard a report on the Israeli radio in Hebrew that the gap of, of, between the poor and the rich is narrowing. The, the poor are cu getting, coming off better now. They're building 70,000, we need like 20,000 housing units a year for our young people. They're, they're starting 70,000, not 20,000. Because we have a gap. We have young couples who want to have apartments. Everything in Israel has to be very measured, very careful. I mean, we're not a rich country, but we're getting there. So what I want to do now is talk a little bit about President Trump. And I spoke in England last November. I spoke there a week after Trump's victory. And the British were still celebrating Brexit. How many people know what Brexit is? Amen. Okay. And I want to give you a, a short lecture on European socialism. The Europeans are a crazy bunch. The Europeans have been slaughtering each other for millennia, 2,000 years, starting with the Romans and the Greeks. And little by little, you have the formation of these nations. The French are fighting the Portuguese and Spanish, the Italians, or after playing the violin, they're still fighting other nations. The British are fighting the French, the French are fighting the Germans, the Germans are fighting the Russians. Everybody's fighting everybody. Hundreds of millions of people, white Christian Europeans being slaughtered. Isn't that crazy? So after World War II, the socialists in Brussels came out with a new rule. At first it didn't seem like it was socialists, but they came out and said the following. We of the European Union, that was Benelux, that was Common Market, that was European Union, we have to ensure, we have to make sure to it that there never again will be a war on European territory. And they did it. 
Isn't it wonderful? No war on European soil. The French, the Germans, everyone's okay now. 27 countries in the European Union. And they're not slaughtering each other. When you know European history, you know, that's pretty remarkable. I mean, America had a crazy civil war, but that's it. But the Europeans fighting each other for 2,000 years. And so here comes the problem. Here comes the fly in the ointment. So the Europeans say, now wait a second, let's analyze this. Why are the Europeans killing each other for 2,000 years? And they came up with three words, God, religion, and nationalism. If it weren't for God, if it weren't for religion, if it weren't for nationalism, there'd be no war. How many people saw Fiddler on the Roof? Okay, Fiddler on the Roof, I've seen it maybe a dozen times. And I always am, am astonished at a certain part there where Tevye, the milkman, is talking to God. And he points his finger at God and says, Why did you make us the chosen people? Could you choose somebody else? Yeah. Because every time God chooses the Jews, they pay for it. They're killed, they're tortured, they're expelled from their towns in Russia. And a lot of Jewish people, you know, you guys ask why did Obama get the Jewish vote? Why did the Democrats get all these, you know, yellow dog Democrat Jewish votes? You know what a yellow dog Democrat is. If you have the best Republican guy in the world, and against him you have a yellow dog, but he's a Democrat, you vote for the yellow dog. It's called the yellow dog Democrat. You know, I travel all over the country, so I pick up all these terms in Alabama, other kinds of towns, and places, and states. And so the Europeans came up with the same conclusion. This whole thing about God and Jesus Christ and nationalism has been the root cause of all the wars. If you abolish God, God forbid, if you abolish God, if you abolish religion, if you abolish Jesus Christ, it's not going to be any more war. This is Soviet socialism. The ideology of the Soviet Union was you ban God, you ban religion, you ban Jesus Christ, you ban Judaism, you ban Islam. All religions are banned. And you kill the priests, the rabbis, and the imams. That's what the Soviets did. Ironically, today, under Putin, there's a remarkable reformation taking place. Not reformation, it's a remarkable uh, uh, revival. It's not the uh, white Anglo Saxon Protestant Baptist or Baptocostal or Pentecostal, it's Russian Orthodox, which is very totalitarian. There is no room in Russia for other types of Christianity, but it's Christian still. Putin is a, a religious Christian. Maybe not the way Americans understand it. I live in the Middle East. I understand orthodoxy. There are very striking similarities between orthodox Judaism and orthodox Russian Christianity. Totalitarian. No room for other ideas. But in their own way, Putin is a religious nationalist. That's why they hate him. And so I was in England, and the British are losing their country to all this immigration from Islamic countries. And the British are a little crazy in their own way. I'm going to share a conspiracy theory, which I think is true. How do I think it's true? My wife picked up information in Arabic. Remember Lady Diana? And she had this accident in the tunnel in Paris. Did you know that, according to the Egyptian press, she was in Egypt, she was pregnant from Dodi, Muslim father, and she converted to Islam. How many people heard the Lady Diana converted to Islam? I mean, that's what the Egyptians say. Why would they lie about it if she didn't convert? And she's pregnant with a Muslim baby because it's the religion of the father. And so if Harry becomes king of England, the mother of the king is a Muslim. And his brother is a Muslim. Or brothers, if, he, if she were allowed to live. And so I think MI6 decided with the orders of the Queen of England. The Queen of England is the titular head of the Anglican Church. 
So it's kind of like you shouldn't mess around with England when it gets to the very, very hard of things. Remember the Crusades? Remember Richard the Lionhearted? I mean, the British fought some of the most difficult battles against Islam a thousand years ago. And it's the British who saved the world from Nazism. And what did the Americans say? These Europeans are crazy. Leave us out of it. Although the Japs attacked at Pearl Harbor December 7, 1941. You're talking about 39, 40, 41, three years America is neutral in the war against the Nazis and the Japanese. And Roosevelt knew about Pearl Harbor coming. But Roosevelt also knew that 50% of the Americans were opposing the war with the Germans and the Japanese precisely for the same reason that they opposed the war in World War I. Because America was isolationist. Why should America get involved in these crazy European wars? Because the Europeans are all crazy. So today, the Europeans are struggling with a negotiation with the EU, but the Europeans are beginning to wake up. There's beginning to be a Christian revival in England. They want me to move to England so I can preach there. They don't got crazy people like me in England. They're all very popular in there. I say, okay. So, all of a sudden you have Brexit. All of a sudden you have Trump winning. So let me tell you a little bit about American politics. American politics is like a pendulum. Give or take. Every eight years, power is switched from the Republicans to the Democrats, and the Democrats to the Republicans, and the Republicans to the Democrats, and it goes back and forth all the time. Forgive me for saying it, it's like a football game. It's like a baseball game. It's like a basketball game. Everyone's fighting for the cause, then they go, oh, go out and have a beer. It's over, it's over. The problem is in these elections, something very malignant has happened. And now all of a sudden you still have people like Valerie Jarrett and uh, Loretta Lynch. Obama's not saying it, but these people are saying it. We need more blood in the streets of America. This, I, heard, I saw it today. These people are not going to accept losing power. You know, people joke about it, crybabies get over it. No, they're not crybabies. They're socialist, communist, totalitarians. That's right. It is the will of the American people to have the Republican administration for these four, maybe eight years. And so again, I really beg you, pray for Trump. Yes. Even if you didn't vote for him, or you didn't agree with him, he is the alternative to some pretty horrible things that went on for eight years. And I know, because I've been traveling the United States, for the last 27 years, I see the decline morally of this country. But the Christian revival has started. I see it in churches all over the country. And I'm on a high since November the 8th. So you see the European Union socialists, they hate Putin because he's a religious man and a nationalist. They hate Netanyahu, he's a religious man and a nationalist. They hate the English for Brexit. They hate Trump for being a religious man and a nationalist. I predict Marine Le Pen is going to win in France. Kurt Wilders is going to win in Holland. I think there's going to be a Christian revival throughout Europe because there is no other choice. This Islamic raping of the women and crime wave in Europe has to stop. You know, there's a saying, it takes a thief to know a thief. I'm that thief. I'm married to a thief. She came from that country, from Egypt. You Americans are so naive, you're so wonderful, you're so loving. Oh, we have to take in the asylum seekers. We have to take in these poor refugees. Oh, we love them. That because you're a Christian. That's the Christian viewpoint towards these poor refugees. But it takes a thief to know a thief. And you don't understand what the plan of these people is, which is to make America a Muslim country. And the day will come when they are so numerous in this country that if you don't become a Muslim, they're going to slit your throat here too. And the plan is to do it to the Jews immediately and to the Christians married to the Jews. Do you understand now why I'm forming a Judeo-Christian party to run for office in Jerusalem? Because we're going to be on the receiving end of 10 million immigrants. 6 million Jews, 4 million Christians. 
We'll even take some, you know, white Anglo-Saxon ba Southern Baptists. <laughs> which are my favorite. You remember the joke, what's the difference between Southern Baptists and Northern Baptists? Northern Baptists go to hell. <laughs> that joke is big time in Texas, let me tell you. I'm very popular in the Southern Baptist churches. Well, we'll take some Pentecostals too. And maybe even some Methodists, right, Pastor Glenn? And so I wanted to, I think it's overall, I think it's good news. The American people are standing on their feet again. They're coming back to their senses. The American debt is beginning, at least not, maybe not to shrink so much, but it's, it's stopping the expansion of the debt. And Trump was the only one I ever heard say, we have the oil, the gas, and the coal to cut America's debt to 10 trillion, from 20 trillion. I never heard the Democrats say that. So I'm really praying that Trump will succeed. One more point as far as analysts. I was an acting rabbi for 70 days in Williamsport, Pennsylvania. And I know the people there. Jew, Christian. There's a lot of oil, a lot of gas, and a lot of coal in Pennsylvania. And I would listen to CNN. Oh, Pennsylvania's voting for Hillary. Yeah, right. After they, when the EPA destroyed all these energy people. People lost their jobs. I said, I know Pennsylvania is going over to Trump. And there are other states. I have, I have Christians. You know, I travel all around the country. I speak in Ohio, Pennsylvania, New York. I, I'm everywhere. And they'll say to me, we've had it with Obama. He's destroying this country economically. How do you go from $5 trillion to $20 trillion? And so I have faith that this debt is going to start coming down. America has to be the greatest country on earth. It is an exceptional country as long as you are faithful to God. And you remember what Alexis the Pope said in 1820. He said America will be the greatest country on earth because the American people are good people and their pulpits are on fire for the Lord. Conversely, when America's pulpits will no longer be on fire for the Lord, America loses its preeminence. That's where we are now. America just took one step back from the precipice. Yes. these elections. You still have a long way to go to get away from the precipice and start climbing again. But you'll do it. I'm sure you'll do it. And it's in Israel's interest that you do it. And I think Israel also is heading more and more towards the right, more towards conservatism, pro-God, pro-religion. And it will be my job to help heal the wounds of 2,000 years of hatred between Jews and Christians. This is what I'm going to do in Israel with this party. So I wanted to conclude by saying that I want you all to pray for this party. People ask me, what should we pray for? How can we pray for you? I said, all I want you to do is pray that God's will be done on earth and in heaven. Because I don't want anything that God does not want. God has blessed me with the most wonderful wife in the world, Rachel, the most wonderful sons, the most wonderful grandkids. I have a beautiful house. I haven't killed anyone, I haven't stolen, I haven't raped, I haven't coveted, you know, Ten Commandments. I'm running for office, my empire will be in Israel, it is in Israel, it will be in Israel. All of this is a gift from God, I believe, because I have been serving God for 27 years. So if you ask me how to pray, pray that God's will be done on earth and in heaven. This party hopefully will be registered in July, and we start our campaign. I believe we can get... 10, 14 members of Knesset out of 120 at this stage with what we have now. But Israel's population is 6.5 million. When 10 million Jews and Christians move to Israel, my party will be the biggest party in the Knesset if, if this is God's will. And I believe God is going to send the Jews and Christians home. Hosea 11.10 says, My children, Ephraim, are going to come home trembling from the West. The Jews are going to be leaving America, going back to, not because of the Christians, but because of the Islamic terrorism. Because they're going to carry out 9-11 attacks on this country. And so you have to support <coughs> your churches, your pastors, your politically elected civic leaders, support your military, support your law enforcement, and, and strengthen your, yourselves for what's coming. 
Because as soon as you have a, a non-Muslim president, the Muslims say, oh, we don't have a Muslim in the White House anymore. Now we have to get ready for a war against the Christians. And they are planning big and bad things against America. And so I pray for you that God will bless you and strengthen you and keep America on top as number one, always. Thank you very much.